kids. I'm just waiting for my opportunity to speak. I'm just <laughs> like, a, like a crouching uh, tiger or something, just waiting for my opportunity. Do you want to speak now? No, go, go ahead. <laughs> I kind of said something. I let, let a little bit out. Oh, yeah. You hold this. Okay. Guess what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm not gonna hopefully put that on me and yeah, not, not in me. Yeah, I'm not going to bust your balloon. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, your left, my right. Oh, uh, whatever. All right. That's fine. Yeah, that's perfect. I'm stick you. I hope it don't stick me either. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Let me put this too, I think. I think that's going to be better. That's good. Okay. I, think it's, I think so. Do you, yeah. want, do you want to keep the mic? I, I can. Okay. Be my guest. Yeah. Roy, thank you so much for that warm, warm welcome and greeting. And it's, uh, I look forward to working with you and the rest of the leadership team and the various other leadership teams getting to know uh, all of you well in the coming months and years uh, as we journey together. Right, Melissa? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. It was so awesome driving to, to church this morning and uh, looking to the east at Mount Lassen and north to Shasta, and it was particularly clear, and it was so beautiful. It is so good to be with you all today. It is. So I would like to welcome you and say thank you for opening up your hearts and uh, you know your friendships to us, and it's just, I look forward to, again, uh, getting to know you all better uh, in the coming uh, days and months and years as we journey together. Um, so uh, you, you will be expecting or expect a phone call from me uh, in the next little bit. I want to call all the families in our church directory and just to introduce myself to you and uh, let you know that I'm here to serve with you and I look forward to our time together. I do want to mention that I will be probably calling on my cell phone, which is a 626 area code. Um, and that means that I'm not a telemarketer. Chances are it's going to be me and not a telemarketer, okay? So, so, please, so, so please don't disregard if I get your voicemail. Don't disregard that phone call. Uh, call me back. I just want to chat with you and just say hello, and uh, it's going to be great. Um, so, uh, yeah, 626 is my area code. It's from Southern California in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, so that's where I got that phone number. And um, so I think that, was that about it, Melissa? Kind of introductory types of things. So for those of you who helped us move in, uh, move into our house, unload our truck, and, and uh, I so, so much appreciate all of you who, who came out for that. And it went so quickly because there were so many of you. So thank you so much, uh, those of you who ha did that, and then others of you brought food to us, and it's so fantastic. We so much appreciate uh, your generosity and your kindness. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Pastor Mark, thank you for that warm installment, um, and I appreciate you coming up for this, and thank you for being a part of that. So the, for those of you who were uh, helping us move in, you might have noticed that we have a few bikes. Did anybody notice that? Yeah, a few of you, okay, yeah. So I, I have a confession uh, that I wanna make uh, today. I have an addiction, and my addiction is cycling. In fact, I try to put in over 100 miles on my bike, and those of you who helped us move in might have known the number of bikes that we have. We have like, um, what, about eight, I guess? And four of those are mine. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I'm one, I'm one down because last week we went to the coast, and uh, I didn't strap in my mountain bike very well, and it came off our bike rack. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, it got destroyed. The chain stay got bent a little bit, and the back wheel was just mutilated, and so I ended up taking the parts off that I wanted to keep and was able to keep, and the rest just went into the trash can. So I'm, I'm a bike down. 
back down. So, but anyway, I like to road bike, and like I said, I put in over 100 miles uh, each week. I try to, and I was thankful this week that I was so far able to get out a couple of times uh, this week. So I look forward to going out tomorrow morning before it becomes unbearably hot, <laughs> which will happen quickly, right? 4, 4 a.m. is the... <laughs> No, <laughs> I will be hopefully sleeping peacefully, <laughs> yeah. But there was a group of riders that, uh, that when we lived in Napa that we would try to ride together once a week. And we would put in 36, sometimes 60 miles together, and we would go up valley and we would go over to Sonoma and uh, about halfway would be our stop point at a wonderful cafe with a nice beverage of choice and a pastry. Oh, we had a great time together. The first several miles of our, of our morning ride together were spent uh, riding side by side, chit-chatting, uh, catching up with each other, uh, hearing the stories from the past week, and uh, for the, after those first several miles, we would fall into a, a single file line, a pace line. And we would follow each other as close as we dare, 10, 12 inches apart, following the person in front behind their slipstream. And if you cycle, you know that in that slipstream is where the easy riding is, right? Because you're in the slipstream and the person in front of you is doing all the work. It was great being in that slipstream. Uh, one of the riders that we would go, I would ride with, uh, he was a bigger guy, and so to get behind him was the place to be because his slipstream was, was big, right? And another one of the riders that we went with, he was a smaller guy, so you had to really tuck in behind him to find that little slipstream behind this guy, but that is where you wanted to be. There are a few things as we uh, went, fast, uh, went uh, to our, our cafe stop and there were a few signals that were important to communicate with each other. And let me go through with you uh, some of these, uh, these hand signals. So the leader, the one in the front, the one that was uh, cutting the wind for all of us to follow him, was the one that could see the obstacles ahead, right? And so what he would do is he would keep an eye down the road, and sometimes there would be a trash can on the side of the road, or there might be some type of debris like a branch or a ro rock or, you know, something that we had to go around, right? And so the signal for that was he would take his right hand and sweep it around be beside him to his back and kind of point behind him. And the riders behind would see that and he would know, we would know, that there is an obstacle up ahead and we need to move to the left to go around it. And we would follow him as he safely made his way around that obstacle. So that was an important hand signal that we would use, right, as we traveled down that road to our destination together. And these were important ones and each person would then go down. Uh, sometimes, sometimes with me at the back, I would be, you know, you get so into the ride and you're so, you're concentrating to stay on that wheel. Don't lose that wheel. Don't lose that wheel as we race down the road. And I would, the last rider, would swing my arm uh, behind me to the imaginary person behind me, all right? You were just in that, that exercise comatose uh, that would easy, we would be easy to get into, and I would just forget that, no, there's no one behind you, not what are you doing, come on. But there we were. So that's the first signal, sweep back, there's something in the way, watch out, you need to move. We would look, okay, so there was, that was the first one. Another one was sometimes on the road that we were going on, a, 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 a driveway uh, would be coming into that road that we were riding on, and there might be gravel or rocks or those types of things. And so this, and, and we don't want, you don't want to ride over that on your road bike because, you know, when you're doing on a 28 mil tire, um, that's pretty narrow. And if you hit some rocks, you could be down really quickly. So the signal for rocks ahead or gravel ahead or dirt would be this and then the sweep behind. And each per person would know who was following that there was something in the way or gravel in the way that we needed to go around. 
Uh, some additional uh, signals or voice uh, commands or, or whatever would be, if we were going to the left, we would look around us, look to the side, look behind us to make sure that there was no traffic coming, obviously. So uh, when, and when it was clear, we would say, clear, and each person in the group would then give, say that, clear, 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 and we would know that would be, it was safe to turn to the left. Another command or signal that was used would be if we were turning right, we would go, uh, you know, point in that direction, and uh, we would know that we would all need to turn that way. So these are important commands that were given, and these commands that were given um, were a demonstration that we use for each other of how much we cared for each other that we were looking out for one another, that we cared about one another's safety, right? As we journeyed down the road together. I think that there's some similarities between these, this type of communication that we had in that uh, group ride and the church family uh, in this community of faith, that there are words that we use to demonstrate that we care about one another. You know, there's an exciting uh, scripture passage. It's found in Mark chapter 12. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open your Bibles to this particular passage. And Jesus, we find Jesus in the temple courtyards. And um, <clears throat> the, the context of this is that there have been a number of, uh, of various religious leaders who have come to Jesus and they're just bombarding him with accusations. They're trying to catch him in a trap. They're trying to entrap him and uh, get, him, get him to say something that they can use against him. And here he is with this person, this individual, another religious leader comes to Jesus with another question. So Mark chapter 12, starting with verse 28, we read this. One of the teachers of the law had heard them debating, and noticing that Jesus had given them good answers, he asked them, of all the commandments which are, which is the most important? What's interesting about that question is, down through the centuries, the rabbis were, uh, would try to uh, distill down the, the, the commandments, the Torah, into the fewest words possible. And Hillel gives a great example of that. Uh, one of the great rabbis, Jewish rabbis. So this question this, that this religious leader, this scribe was asking Jesus was very common, right? D just d distill down the law, the Torah, in just the fewest words possible. So that's the context that we find Jesus coming into. But it's surprising, though, that in this story that you would expect a controversy, right? Because here's another religious leader coming to Jesus, and tr it seems like he is trying to entrap Jesus in some sort of a controversy, uh, a discussion that is going to cause division. Th these days, it seems like it's easy to get caught up in division, doesn't it? Well, you just think about what's going on in the world around us. Um, and the political arena um, and the discussions th in that context. And then there's the religious uh, context and the discussions. There are enough controversies and divisions going on around right now to, to you know, fill up an entire library and then some. There is a lot going on. And in this story, we may be saying to ourselves, well, here's another controversy, here's another discussion and, and, and uh, cause for division. But I'm thankful that in this story, Jesus does not uh, get discouraged. He does not shy from the question that is being asked. Because in his response lies a great principle for a community of faith, for you and me. And so I invite you to consider these next several words. Starting with verse 29, Jesus now is responding to this religious leader, and he says, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, of course, this is not the commandment, but rather this is the preamble. Uh, this is the preamble, actually, to the Ten Commandments. And in this word, in this phrase, this phrase here that I just read is what the Jewish call the Shema. You know what the Shema is? Shema is Hebrew for the word hear. Hear, O Israel, the very first word, Shema. Uh, when Melissa and I were uh, in Israel a few years ago on our pastor's um, trip to Israel, 
uh, which was great. We had a great, fantastic time. Um, but one thing that we noticed there in Israel, uh, in, our, in our hotel room, and lots of other places were these small rectangular boxes called the mezuzah. Um, when we were leaving Israel in the Tel Aviv airport, there was a large one. I had never seen one this big. It was big, rectangular boxes. Many of them are hollowed out inside, right? And in that little cavity, in that mezuzah, is a scroll, a rolled up scroll with these words, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And every pious Jew, even today, repeats these words in the morning and the evening, declaring their allegiance to the one true God. So Jesus is drawing from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy chapter 16. Um, I believe it's chapter 16, yeah, chapter 6, excuse me. These, hear, O Israel. This, is, this calls Israel's attention to, uh, uh, to God and their commitment to the one true God. Jesus continues now still continuing to draw from the Old Testament, which I find interesting. Verse 30, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. These words are also taken from the Shema, continuing on there, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting with verse 4. And in Deuteronomy, Moses has given this command to Israel, but what's interesting is that Moses, in that command from Deuteronomy, says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. Jesus, centuries later, comes along and adds another component, and that word is mind. He, he adds that word mind, which is, gives us the idea of an all-encompassing invitation to love God. It is a full heart commitment, right? Jesus is inviting us to consider to love him with our complete being, where nothing is left out, our heart, mind, soul, and strength a sincere and fervent and intellectual love, and even an energetic love, that he is calling us to love him with our entire being. Here in this beautiful scripture passage, this is a, a, an agape love, the kind of love that it's challenging to love this kind of way. We put lots of things in our love and our commitment to God, don't we? There are lots of things that come into our lives that we allow to come in to our lives that sort of distra distract us from that full commitment to Jesus. Things, and, and some of these, many of these, are, are good and they're worthwhile. But the point that Jesus is trying to make is that we want to make God number one. Yeah. Be most, allow ourselves to be most committed to Jesus, to love him most. This kind of love is impossible in and of ourselves without first recognizing that he first loved us. Just a few short chapters later, Jesus demonstrating that great love by dying on the cross. He first loved us, and it allows us to then love him more. We see that commitment that he has made to us, and in return, we want to commit our lives to him. Hear, O oh God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, Jesus says. Next verse, verse 31, in this response to this, uh, this religious leader. The second is this, Jesus says, uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 31, and this is also drawn from the Old Testament. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. It is imperative to note that our neighbor, loving our neighbor comes after loving God. Our love for God flows, uh, flows out to other people. That commitment to Jesus, the, the natural response to our love and devotion to Jesus, it flows out to other people, those people that we come in contact with. In this command, Jesus is again drawing from the Old Testament, this time from Leviticus chapter 19. And what's interesting is that in its original context, when it was written there in the Old Testament, this did not include outsiders. It did not include Gentiles. Though, of course, that was not Jesus, God's original intent, right? Uh, it was to love everyone, even in the Old Testament time. 
Jesus did a new thing, though. He quoted it without qualifications and without limiting boundaries, extending the, the definition and the understanding of who our neighbor is to include everyone, even our enemies. He took an old law, filled it with new meaning, and in this new meaning, Jesus uh, pulled together the two great commandments, the two parts of the commandments, which no rabbi had ever done before, the first four and the last six of the Ten Commandments. Love God, love people. Amen. And I think that that should give us great hope, you and me today, that Jesus can take something old and create new life. That Jesus can take something that's old, maybe worn out, and recreate it and give it new life and breathe new life and new energy into that. Hope that God will create in us the desire to love other people, to love people as we love ourselves because he first loved us. Those who might look differently than us those who might believe differently than us, those whose lifestyle is different than ours, and yes, maybe even our enemy, may we be that kind of community that loves our neighbor. As Jesus has called us to do and to be, may we be a community that lives that out as we demonstrate it, as we live that love for God out in our neighborhoods, people that we work with, people that we, uh, our neighbors and our associates and our friends down the street and different people that we come in contact with. Well, the story begins to wrap up in the next couple of verses, verse 32, where it says, well said, the man said, replied. This is now that religious leader who is now responding to Jesus' words, and this man knows all of this and even more, actually, of course, the historical context, right? I mean, we've just really brushed the surface of, our, of the Old Testament understanding here. This man would have been well-versed in the, the, the connections and the things that Jesus is doing here. But the man says, well, well done, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that love or that God is one and that there is no other. Uh, to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifice. And here's the surprising twist. Did you catch it? Here, this religious leader unlike the others who have come before Jesus earlier in these stories, who have argued with him and tried to, to entrap him in a controversy and a disagreement, now is agreeing with Jesus. Can I have an amen? Yeah. I mean, here is this gentleman who is steeped in religious tradition that goes back for centuries and generations, and this new teaching is coming along, and this man is in agreement with it. Well said, teacher, you are right. You have declared, you have said words that are correct. And a miracle has happened. A miracle seems to have taken place. There is, while there is no public declaration of recognizing Jesus as the Messiah, there seems to be a step in that direction. And in fact, Jesus alludes to this in the next verse with his response to the man in verse 34. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. We know nothing else of this man. This gentleman, this scribe, he walks out of the pages of scripture, and we know nothing else about him. We don't know if he came to believe. I like, would like to suggest that he did come and believe, that he did recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior. Maybe he was a part of that group later that's recorded in Acts of a group of scribes and Pharisees, religious leaders who came to believe in Jesus. I like to believe that he was a part of that group. So there we were. My friends and I, kicking it down the road on our bikes, trying to stay together, desperately trying to stay on the wheel in front, and I'm seeing stars, and we're hanging on by a thread. I was hanging on by a thread, and, uh, and, and 
we would keep our eye on the leader, the one in front. We would keep our eye on the signals that he was given, that he was handing down, that he was passing to those who were following him. We wanted to keep an eye on that man, that person in that lead position because they knew the obstacles that was before us. He knew where we would have to swerve around. He knew that there was gravel ahead. He knew that there might be a car or someone uh, walking on the side of the road that we needed to go around, safely navigate around. He, we needed to stay on his wheel and we needed to keep our eyes on him. And I think that serves as a great reminder to us as a community of faith that as we journey together, we are called to keep our eyes on Jesus. And may we do that. May we keep our eyes on Jesus. As we journey together in the time that we have together, may we keep our eyes on Jesus. May we follow his invitation to love him completely and entirely. May our lives reflect his love for us so much that it flows out to the community, to the people around us, and people will say about Palisadro, there is something different about that community. May we follow Jesus. Jesus is the one that knows that the, the obstacles that are before us. He says, hey, uh, here's a danger. Here's something that you need to be aware of. Tuck in behind me. Follow my lead, and you will be safe. Not to say that there won't be any dangers, because there will. But may we be a community that loves God, loves people. I don't know about you, but I'm... I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the type of person that likes to check boxes. You know what I mean? I've gone to church today, check. <laughs> I've paid my tithe, check. I've prayed at my meal times, check. I've done this, I've done that. I fulfilled my religious commitment. And here in this scripture passage is another reminder that loving God, loving people is out of my control. The love of Jesus, fill, may, may, may my heart be open to receive the love of Jesus. And may that love flow out to those we come in contact with. May we be a church community that loves God and loves people. Amen. And as we go, as we journey together, I look forward to our time together to getting to know you better without these crazy masks on our, cell, on our faces. Though it is kind of fun to come to church with a mask on. That's kind of exciting to me. <laughs> and going to banks with a mask on, I find that particularly exciting. It's true. <laughs> Go. May we love God and love people. Now go, go in the peace and the strength of God, ready to impart to others what you have first received from him, and may the presence and the power of God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with you today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.